Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to take a look at a project that could become the first mission far into the void between the stars. The Interstellar Probe. We'll talk with Dr. Elena Provornikova from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory about this futuristic mission. But first, we journey far back in time to an era when the Milky Way may have merged with another smaller galaxy and learn how that event changed the Milky Way. Next, we're going to travel even further back in time and out in space as evidence suggests one of the most important constants in cosmology may not be a constant after all. Finally, we're going to look up in the sky as a lunar eclipse will be visible early Wednesday morning over most of the United States before we welcome our special guest. Roughly 10 billion years ago, as the Milky Way was starting to take shape, our nascent family of stars may have collided and merged with a smaller satellite galaxy, a new study suggests. By examining tremors on the surfaces of around a hundred red giant stars, astronomers at Ohio State University found evidence for this ancient galactic collision. Today, most of the stars from the earliest era of our Milky Way sit toward the center of our galaxy, while those from the satellite galaxy Gaia Enceladus are found closer to the rim. Now, since the Big Bang, the universe has expanded, and the rate of that expansion is measured using a number called the Hubble constant. However, the exact value of this constant is still in question. And a new study shows it may not even be a constant after all. The examination of type 1a supernovae show the Hubble constant may have been lower in the early universe than it is today. This could potentially help explain a major conundrum for astronomers who measure higher values of the Hubble constant when looking at nearby objects than they do when measuring waves created during the earliest era of matter. A lunar eclipse on May 26th will be seen over most of the United States. Uh, viewers west of the Mississippi will see the moon totally eclipsed, while those in the east will witness a partial eclipse. No special equipment is needed to view this event, and lunar eclipses are a perfect opportunity to view a celestial event with the whole family. However, timing may be an issue as this event will begin just before 2 a.m. in most places on Wednesday and will continue until the moon sets right around dawn. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Dr. Elena Provarnikova from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory about her work on a project that could become humankind's 
first mission deep into the space between the stars. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Elena Provornikova. She is a space scientist at the uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And she is working on designing a probe that will journey far beyond the distance any interstellar, any other probe has ever made, made it to. Welcome to the show, Elena. Hi, James. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Um, so can you just give us an overview of what is the interstellar probe and what do you hope to accomplish with it? Well, absolutely. So um, interstellar probe is the space mission concept uh, to go to the edge of our heliosphere. That's the bubble we live in. And also to go beyond into the interstellar space. Um, so this is the mission to discover the complex interactions between the material coming from the sun, that we call solar wind, that's the plasma and magnetic field, uh, and how soul wind interacts with the interstellar medium, where we have charged particles, we have neutral atoms, we have dust and a magnetic field, and how all these interact with each other and how it shapes our bubble globally. And, you know, our bubble is not static, right? Because the sun is dynamic, so um, our heliosphere is also very dynamic. So we're going to look at the um, during a long time, we're going to look at our bubble, how it evolves uh, in time. And also, for the first time, this mission will sample directly the material between stars in the interstellar medium. Um, also, we're going to be so far away from the sun, so we can actually turn and look back at our heliosphere. And for the first time, to take a picture and um, actually get an idea of what it looks like, because we have no idea. So that's the 50-year mission, and within 50 years, we will reach the distance about 400 astronomical units, which is uh, 10 times farther from the sun than Pluto's orbit, and also more than twice the distance that Voyager's, um, Voyager spacecraft will ever reach before they uh, end operation. So we want to be ready by, uh, to be launched in early 2030s. And um, that's interstellar probe really marks the first step of humanity into the local galaxy. Uh, so let me uh, maybe talk a little bit more about um, what we hope to accomplish and what we're actually uh, interested to find out. Please. Um, so as I said, we live, uh, we live in the bubble, blown out by the solar wind expanding from the sun in all directions. And we move through that interstellar, the sun moves through the interstellar medium. And um, over the life of our sun, it made about 20 revolutions around the center of the galaxy. So we went through different regions in this interstellar medium. Uh, it's possible that we were um, affected by supernova explosions. So there, there were very sun lived sun and the inter, uh, heliosphere lived very interesting life, and um, heliosphere is very important to the solar system because it protects uh, the planets and our Earth from harsh galactic cosmic rays, and it really the heliosphere boundary really deflects about seventy percent of um, this high energy uh, particles, and. There are a lot of fundamental questions that we still do not understand about our heliosphere. You know, how solar and interstellar material interact with each other and how, what's the that's global shape of our heliosphere? Does it have this long tail or it's more like compact or, or it has sort of two, uh, two tails and looks more like a croissant shape? So there are a lot of questions that we don't know. 
And uh, we really hope to find out with this mission. That's fabulous. So the, the possibilities are pretty intriguing. What sort of instruments would you, would you be building into, into the interstellar probe? Yeah, we are considering um, a set of instruments that could be an example for this mission. Um, so called baseline, baseline payload. And um, so among the instruments, we would have um, a suite of instruments that will study energetic particles in different energy ranges from, you know, thermal plasma going to high energy that it's called suprathermal plasma. And there we, we're going to look at the very important particle population that's called pickup ions. So these are very important particles in the outer heliosphere. They, they, they are born from interstellar neutrals. And um, voyagers found out that, in fact, those particles are very important for understanding the, how our bubble is actually uphold. So we're going to look at this particular particle population for the first time because Voyager did not have the proper instrumentation to look at this key particle population. Uh, we're also going to look in, at high energy and energetic particles, and we're also going to look at the cosmic rays. Um, we also have um, instruments that are going to measure uh, magnetic fields and electric fields. Um, also, uh, instruments that measure the interstellar neutral gas. Um, that's very important because we never actually measured interstellar hydrogen. That's, that has a very important effect on the, on the global structure of the helis here. Um, we're also going to carry the camera that's going to measure uh, so-called energetic neutral atoms. So those are atoms that are high energy, um, neutral atoms that they're born in the process that we call charge exchange process. So um, those are atoms, they are born in different regions at the heliosphere boundary. They're very energetic. And by measuring those atoms, we can actually, um, you know, get an idea about this global interaction and um, about the plasma properties in different regions in the heliosphere. So these are some examples that um, uh, uh, we interstellar probe might carry. Uh, but there are also you know, going to such a large distances from the sun also open opportunity for um, exploration in planetary field and in astrophysics. And for example, there could be an option that interstellar probe will do flyby of a new dwarf planet, which we never visited before. For example, it could be um, the planet that called uh, Koiwar, I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, that's a small planet that we never visited, and um, that would be, you know, great discovery by looking at the uh, surface of that planet and understanding what's what's happening in the, uh, there. Uh, there is also opportunity uh, to look at the uh, dust disk around our sun, because we can we can't. Uh, look at this dust is because we are sitting inside of it. So we ha really have to travel far enough and then turn back with the infrared camera and get an idea of this, of this dust disk. And that's the, the this disk is the remain from the planetary accre accretion and constant collisions between bodies in the solar system. So that really helps us to understand uh, planetary formation. Um, there is uh, another opportunity is to look at the extragalactic background light. And this is something that astrophysicists have, would be very interested in looking. And uh, again, because we are at, you know, at Earth, we're sitting inside our dust disk. We are not able to uh, measure this light. So we need to get out. And using this infrared uh, camera, look at this light that will tell us about the early uh, phases of formation of the galaxies and stars. So there are a lot of science opportunities, and uh, this is just the example of instruments that we can carry. Yeah. So you say you're looking at a possible launch in the early 2030s. What would the timeline and the opportunities look like heading out to, to, to uh, that 
area. I mean, where you're going to be able to pass, if you know, yeah, you're going to be able to pass any planets or live during gravitational assist, let's say, or. Yeah, is, absolutely. You know, like, like, yes. Yes. So um, if we launch in early uh, 2050s, uh, 2030s, I'm sorry, early 2030s. That just saved me 20 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I want to see the launch. So no 2050, <laughs> 2030. Um, we're going to do uh, uh, Jupiter Gravity Assist. That will give us a good kick going to the um, heliosphere boundary. So in about 15 years, we're going to reach the, um, the boundary of the heliosphere that we call heliopause. And... Um, so compare this to 35 years that it took to Voyager for Voyagers. So that we're going to go pretty fast. We're going to go uh, with a speed which is twice as large as um, speed of Voyager 1. And also in another seven years, the interstellar probe will explore, explore completely unknown region in the interstellar space uh, because Voyager would go, Voyagers would go silent before reaching this region. So in another seven years from heliosphere boundary, we're going to be sampling uh, the completely unknown um, interstellar space material. Wow, that's so cool. And um, so what is next in the development of the interstellar probe? Where are you at now and where is it going? So we, um, we are finishing our last year of the interstellar probe concept study. And uh, we finalized the science goals for the mission. Um, so the mission is the uh, heliophysics mission. Um, there are three um, there are three science objectives for the for the heliophysics that are uh, centered around you know understanding the global structure of the heliosphere, the dynamics, and understanding the space between stars. Um, also, we looked at the uh, science goals for the planetary. Uh, field and also for astrophysics. So the science goals are in a great shape. Um, we got all the science questions that a community, science community is interested in. Um, uh, we are finishing engineering study uh, for the mission and laying out trades. Yeah, I would like to tell you that um, our approach is to sort of lay out the menu. What can be done within such a mission? Like what are the, what are the what what science can you do? What instruments can you put on board? What is the trade between different instruments and so on? Uh, so we are working on laying laying out those trades, and um, we are planning uh, several conferences and sessions that are devoted to specifically discussions of uh, of the mission, and uh, we are going to deliver a report uh, to NASA. Uh, based on all the discussions we had over the last four years. And um, uh, all these findings are backed up by the community. We have about 500 uh, interested scientists and engineers who are uh, actively involved into, uh, into the developing this concept. And um, then we will hear from NASA. That's great. I'm staying very optimistic. I'm very excited about this mission. This, this is a fabulous project. I'm really looking forward to seeing it develop over the years. Um, and so finally, how can people learn, where can people learn more about the Interstellar Probe? Yeah, I would encourage um, people to uh, go to our website, interstellarprobe.ghuapl.edu. And uh, we have a lot of webinars there, a lot of links to different articles, uh, a lot of cute pictures, <laughs> pretty pictures that we developed. Um, also, we, we have a page where you can sign up and um, you will receive letters and emails about the events we are planning. So um, please engage and come on board with us. That's great. Well, thank you so much for giving us the honor of your first interview ever. You did a fabulous job. Well, it's my pleasure, James. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'd love to talk to you again anytime. Thank you. All right. Take care. 
And that was uh, Dr. Elena Provernikova, space scientist, what a cool title, at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Make sure to join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we're going to be joined by Dr. Sabina Stanley of Johns Hopkins University. We're going to talk about her work using computer modeling to study the atmosphere of Saturn. Make sure to join us then. And visit us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Uh, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive, gosh darn it. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, Please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.